So we call that one to the church. The, our purpose is not to convert the world, but Christ converts the world. We echo his call of the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit that works in people. And we just echo the call of Christ to them. And uh, the Holy Spirit regenerates and converts. I don't convert anybody. And if I tried to convert somebody, they become a false convert. So I don't want to do that. We want, to, we want people to be led to Christ, and it will be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Good morning, huh? Do you want this? Or do you have yours from last week? Okay, great. Great. And then we kind of went into the characteristics of this age. One of them is that in this age, Bob and I are just having a cool discussion about this and some other stuff. Maybe we'll just repeat it. In this age, there's evil in this age. Um, Israel's in this age with us. And, um, man, someday in this age, we'll be gathered out. The body of Christ will be gathered out. The call will be gathered out of the world. Um, so some things that characterize the period of time that we live in today. A couple other things. Um, and it's, you say, oh, that's all normal, but it won't always be that way. And that's kind of, that's really, really, it's exciting to me. No, it won't always be this way. And I gave you some verses last week, and I kind of fumbled through them all. I had a lot going on. But um, I put them in your notes there. Um, I'm just reading in chapter 20 of Revelation, halfway into verse 4. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's us. That's the call to that one. The rest of the dead did not come until the thousand years ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such as the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. This period of time is coming to an end. At some point, he's going to gather us out. And the next period of time ain't going to be like this. It's going to be different. It's going to be way better. Um, so, so this gathering is going to gather us out to where? To another place? To his kingdom. To his, place, yeah. his kingdom is... So it's another planet? <laughs> No. So, here we go. It's not There's a, a lot of them out there. <laughs> I, I just think about that. I think, okay, so we're going somewhere. Right. So, it's not specific. Well, are we really going somewhere? Well, you are definitely are going somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and then this, are you talking about when, when we're the rapture? Rapture or when the graves open up? This is talking about the kingdom. So, this is the millennium. So this is um, this is after Satan's rule. Satan is thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years with the beast and a false prophet. This is the Lord's kingdom. Um, this is not. Oh, I see. Oh, this is the new earth. Right. Um, that's no, later. That's later to come. New heaven and new earth. See, we got Hans is a great guy in Revelation. He gives you a lot on it. The new heaven and new earth is coming later in chapter twenty-one. So I kind of read Revelation written chronologically. So that's kind of the next stage. And at that point, all sin will be cast out of that point. See, what I'm trying to do with this is I'm trying to talk about differences in ages. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to do a revelation study, but it's a good question, Laura. Yeah. I'm trying to show you this period you live in will be different than periods in the future. You'll be resurrected out. Um, and... Your spirit will always be with the Lord, but in this place, this is a thousand years that you'll be reigning with Christ. So that's a thousand years Jesus rules. He rules. Okay. He's got Satan with no, opposition. with no opposition. He's got no rebellion. Right. At the end of the thousand years, Satan's loosed for a little while, and then God deals with him one last time. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. You know, he might have uh, rebellion. Because the Lord says, uh, and those who walk off of Jerusalem, the, the, the keys are going to be reinstalled, all those things. Yeah. And those who go up, uh, it says, uh, uh, and the horses, the, the eyes will be off in their socket. Uh, so there's a, there's a, he will, I mean, he will reign, you know, so it's going to be a, a ruling. And, yeah, he yeah, has no opposition, you know, Satan, and all people say. Yeah. yeah. But because they're on, they're on the redeemed uh, people in the millennium. <clears throat> they are us, reigning at the end, but they are unredeemed people. 
lots of standing on that, and they can be well. They still can. It's now they can walk. Now they still need to be free here on the road. So that's why I came. Yeah, now Satan. Yeah, because it says at the end of the millennium, uh, as many as the sand of the sea shall be filled. Go with Satan. That's kind of sad. They'll do what? They'll walk with Satan. Because when he's going to be released, uh, uh, they're going to walk with him, and again, they're going to walk up towards Jerusalem, and the fire will come down. But it's kind of sad that without, without Satan's influence, I, I thought, you know, they have it so good. That's why when people say to me, oh, if, uh, if I would have this, or uh, God will give me uh, all the money I need, and we'll but th that's why it's not. Mm -hmm. So it's still a fallen world, and there's still the curse. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, it's not the new heaven, it's right. not the new earth. So there's still, there's still sin in the world. It's just Satan is not an active force. So. But the curse is still there. I believe so. So yeah. it leads not back to Eden. I'm, you know what? <laughs> I haven't. I'm, I'm actually in Revelation chapter three and four right now, studying. I haven't studied Revelation three years. It's just not fresh on my mind. Hans is in it like once a week. So, <laughs> but uh, it's excellent stuff. But the, what I'm just the point I'm trying to make with today is that this age that you live in will not be like the ages to come in the future. It's going to be incredible in the future. One more question. Yeah. So, don't get topic. So, those thousand years, then are we going to be alive those thousand years, or is it going to be? Like for a whole thousand years? Even, yes, I do believe you'll be alive. I believe you'll be alive. That's what here we have in this right here. We're reigning with Christ. Yeah. No, we don't reign dead. No. <laughs> yeah, but we're going to go to the thousand years old. Well, I'm thinking you are. I'm thinking you are. Hey, yeah. It's, see, it's tough for you to understand this in this age, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going with what the word says. It says right here. It says, and I know this is, this is the, this is the, the church, the body of Christ that's regenerated. I don't want to say regenerated, brought back, bodily raised. Then I saw thrones and seated on them, to whom all authority to judge was committed. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast nor its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the end, until the thousand years was ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God. And of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So, okay. lean on the word. Lean on the word. Please don't don't trust me. Trust the word of God, and, um, and that's the I know that's that'll work. So, just trying to characterize the age, but it's interesting. We don't think about the age that much. So we live in a time when uh, there's a lot of wickedness in the world. I mean, I went. I told one time, oh, this guy's got an Antichrist. Or, uh, anarchist sign right there. It's like, yeah, my sign says anarchy. And it's like, are you nuts? You know, like, that's the time you live in. So, um, anyway, we, we started over B last week, the formation of the church. Christ said he will build his church. I referenced Matthew 16, 18. It's that Christ built the church. It's his church. He's building it up. Bob and I had a really cool conversation when you guys, uh, when we first sat down this morning, and that the Lord is building a holy temple. But also in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 22 and 23, I think it's worth having the same, just to repeat what we were sharing earlier, is that Christ is in every part of the body. It's the power of the Holy Spirit permeates every believer. He indwells us. And that we're all tied directly to him. It's not, and we had a, Bob had a good example, it's not that it's just the head, but that he is in every part of the body. I think we think of it almost as like, uh, in our DNA, you can tell everything about a human. I'm not a DNA expert, but I know that in DNA, 
all 46 chromosomes are there. And you can tell every part about a human. And that's in the DNA in my leg. That's in the DNA in my neck. That's the DNA in my head. It's the same throughout. And Christ is in all parts of the body. So it's not that the toe is further from Christ or the toe is not indwelt with the Holy Spirit. But the toe is just as filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ. So that's cool stuff. And he's building his temple. It's, a, it's his holy temple. It's not my temple. It's not my, my little church or my little clique or my group. It's his. And today we're going to see the Believer's Commission. Um, flip open to 2 Corinthians 2.16. I'm having such a hard time getting used to a different version of the Bible, but it's good. Four. Who have understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. We all have the mind of Christ, the Holy Spirit. It goes right to what Bob and I were sharing first thing this morning that um, we all have the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit. The Lord will be, lead us individually. I remember when I first became a Christian, I had someone who I knew, they said, you know, I feel like the Lord's leading me to a different place. And that person ended up changing what they were doing, and I really stopped seeing them a lot. And I started thinking to myself, like, so the Lord leads them to a different place. And like, the Lord didn't tell me that about them. The Lord told them that about them. And the Lord leads individuals differently. or not? He, he leads them directly. He's not going to... Don't, I don't tell Adam what to do for the Lord. Adam, the Lord told me today to wear, wear a shirt like that. No, the Lord, <laughs> the Lord didn't tell me that. So he'll tell Adam what he ought to do. You know, and, and the Lord's that good. Um, so, yeah, the mind of Christ in all. No, we have the mind of Christ. Um, and then I also got some sites for the other references to the Great Commission. Matthew 28, Mark 16. And then Romans 10, which is faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So our commission, if, if I were to say to you guys, what's the commission of the body of Christ, the call that ones? What is our commission? What do you think? think Go ahead, John. What's the commission of the body of Christ? That's right. People are preach the gospel. To teach, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So we have to say it so they can hear it. Um, and then in the book the guy goes through how we present the gospel and he goes through quite a few he says uh, and if you've got a blanks a uh, paper with blanks on it, it says the gospel is presented to the unsafe through sacrificial gifts I'll just go right through and fill in the blanks the gospel may be presented to the unsafe through answer to prayer the gospel may be presented to the unsaved by word of mouth So people give sacrificial gifts to missionaries. They, su they support the work of, the, of local pastors. Um, and they give sacrificially to that. Um, if the gospel is presented um, through an answer to prayer. We pray for people's souls. And God answers. Yes, huh? Yeah, sure. We don't have the, okay. Here we go. Thank that you. one's got all the blanks filled in. There we go. I figured out how to do that on my computer really easily. So, and the gospel's presented to the to the unsaved by word of mouth. So we present the gospel to people through what we say. We echo the call of Christ. A couple things are important on that. You got to be willing to place be placed where the Holy Spirit puts you. That is so important. And a lot of times you'll say, I'm not comfortable doing that. I just can't do that. If God's leading you to do it, please go ahead out of your comfort zone. Don't, don't feel like it's, it's just, well, I don't feel comfortable doing it. But if the Holy Spirit's leading you to do it, do it. And, um, 
and just trust that God will work in you. I can't tell you how many times I've felt my flesh want to hold me back for fear's sake, but the Holy Spirit wants to lead me forward for God's glory. And uh, it's that way when it comes to presenting the gospel to people. Our flesh will want to stop us, but the Spirit of God will lead us and pull us forward, even if that's uncomfortable. So that's exciting to know that when we're willing to be placed in the Holy Spirit's use, or to be used by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God will do things. He'll open eyes. He'll use words that we don't even think matter sometimes for someone else. You know, stop following me. <laughs> That was so funny. Laurie had that thing. <laughs> that was such a funny story, but God's using that stuff. You guys remember that story? Tell it. It was one of these people that I've been want- I was wanting to invite them to Friendship Sunday. And uh, they were out walking, and he, was, he had been very, very ill. And so he was <laughs> coming out of the church, and there they were. <laughs> and... Um, I, I invited him to come to church, you know, on Friendship Sunday, and I, I decided to send him a little reminder, and, and I had him. The only track I had was, was uh, an evolution one about a, a monkey. It was a monkey that somebody was following the monkey, being like a monkey. And so I sent him that. That's right. It had the salvation message in the tool. It, so. it, it was just so funny. Well, yeah, coming out of the church and there's that those people that you've been bumping into. Yeah. Like they bump into you again on the cover of the track says, Stop following me. You know, like, <laughs> it's like they're following Lori around and they're not. You know, it's just hilarious. I didn't take it that way. I, thought, I guess you did. I took it that way because like, they're bumping into you and here they are bumping into you again. <laughs> I never thought yeah. I put that together until just now. Yeah. <laughs> It was a strange track. It is a funny track. It's got a man and a couple of monkeys and apes behind him. And he says, stop following me. It's that evolutionary picture. <laughs> so, it's funny to me. Cause... <laughs> so next uh, point I had is the messenger must have the precise truths that constitute the gospel. And oftentimes we feel uncomfortable presenting the precise truths that constitute the gospel, which often has to do with sin and man's need for a savior. And that's oftentimes where we have the rub with people, or we feel uncomfortable. Oftentimes when I witness to people, they laugh. They laugh when they admit they're a liar and a thief. They do. They laugh that they blaspheme God. They laugh at adultery. They laugh at all that stuff. It's because they're uncomfortable. But their response is always interesting to me that they don't get mad at me most of the time. But um, so we have to be able to present the gospel biblically. And if we don't address sin, chances are we're not. That person has to be humble to the point where they see that they have a need for a savior, that they need Christ for redemption from their their sins, their fallen nature. Yes. Yeah, yeah. People know that they that they sin. You know, I think especially uh, they said they live together, for example, and quite often, oh, I know we live in sin. <laughs> you know, they said, oh, I know we live in sin, Paul. You know, so, so just to say that oh, God's law is, is a bit in the heart. And there's many ways people present the gospel today that I wouldn't do it that way um, because it's. I don't believe it's biblical. I don't believe it's biblical to tell someone they have a God-shaped hole in their heart. I just don't believe that. Someone has a God-shaped hole in their heart. I just I just don't believe that. I don't believe that's a biblical way of, of witnessing to someone. You know, because we skirt the issue of sin that they just have this hole in their heart. Man is sinful two ways, by nature and by deed. And when we avoid those things, uh, we really skirt the issue of sin and don't show the need for Christ as a, as a Savior for redemption. So it's important that that's done correctly. Um, so we must have the precise truths that constitute the gospel. Man needs a Savior. He needs Christ to take his place for his sins and put the punishment we deserve on Christ. We need that. And uh, a person must be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, I don't believe it's worthwhile to go out and, uh, and witness out of anger and strife or out of the purpose of some kind of vain. Man, I'm trying to fill up my church. I'm trying to get people here. I'm trying to fill the pews up. That's why we're going out to witness. No, that's not Holy Spirit-type preaching. Um, 
So you want to be filled up with the Holy Spirit out of love for other people and compassion for their souls, where they'll go in eternity. So there's various ways to present the gospel, mechanical means such as literature, television, music, you know, on and on, ways we can present the gospel to people. Um, but here's my question. Um, is just doing good things the same thing as presenting the gospel? It's really not. Is humanitarian work the same thing as presenting the gospel? It's really not. It's nice to do that. It's People need drinking water. I get it. They absolutely need it. But it's not the same thing as presenting the gospel. Um, so, got a few other cool things to characterize the church and the commission that we have. And I'm taking these notes from a really cool uh, message I heard from a guy in Binghamton, New York, Thanksgiving time. I was in a church out there. and Young pastor, I can't tell you enough. If you go to a church with, uh, and you've got a young guy standing up there, like he probably doesn't know anything, man, I'm telling you, you're so wrong <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> I go to some churches, and it's like, there's a guy up there, he's given the sermon 30 times, and he, he acts like he's given the sermon 30 times, you know? Um but I went to this one church in Binghamton, New York, and I really enjoyed this pastor's ministry. And I probably took six pages of notes. But I wanted to, I mean, I took his sermon down. All right, so this is his. His name's Bill. I can't remember his last name. But um, what is the culture of the church? If I were to say, how do you describe the culture of our church? What is it like? How do we characterize our church today? This one? The body of Christ. What should it be characterized? You could tell me the local church. You could tell me the universal church. Go ahead and tell me answer if you want to. So if I was to say, what describes what the church does? What describes how the church behaves? What describes how we act with one another? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you some things he used. We have a culture of evangelism. The church is described as having a culture of evangelism. That we are out busy outreaching. And here's what that does in a couple ways. It gives us deeper fellowship together. When we unite around the gospel, we have closer fellowship. There's people in the church. I'm not trying to knock people. But the ones I have the closest fellowship with are the ones I soul win. The ones who come to the booth with me at field days or go to park with me. Those are the people I have the closest fellowship with in the church. We have deep fellowship. That characterizes the active church. We are close-knit because... We have the same goal, which is the gospel, unity in that. Um, and that we disciples, we have discipleship. Um, that's another thing that characterizes, this is discipleship. This is we're growing together in the word of the Lord. So that characterizes the church. Whether that characterizes the whole universal church at this point, I hope it does. But I, our goal is to have these, this be the culture of our group of meeting here, the little group of believers that we are. Um, I think that ought to be what the culture of the church is. So what defines a community of believers? The gospel. And that we meet around, that we're meeting around the person of Christ and his work on the cross. One question I have for you is what identifies a Christian? What identifies a Christian? Think about that. Is it the fish on their bumper? Is it that they have a shirt that says something Christian on it? Um, what is that? What defines a Christian? How will you identify them? John 13 says this, you'll know them by their love one for another. It won't be by the bumper sticker on their car. It won't be by the t-shirt they're wearing, but you'll know a Christian by their love one for another. And I think that's so valuable that we love one another. I think it's so it's so good for me to have this word today, and I just I want to read those verses out loud. You know, as we talk about the character of the church and what we what we're doing in the church, this is cool to me because if you look at the context of John chapter thirteen, it's when he that the, he's washing the disciples' feet at the beginning, and um, he talks about Judas betraying him and. I skip down to verse 31. we we'll read there. He gives us a new commandment. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while, I am with you. You will seek me. 
And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. The world ought to look into the church and say, the church loves each other. And I think about it like this. Um, so I've got friends, right? And you guys have friends. If the people in your life, now I'll use my parents for an example. My parents know Chris is my friend. Chris keeps my friend. They know Doug's my friend. They know you guys are people I hang out with. They know I hang out with Adam. They know that because I talk about him. Now, Adam's kind of the exception because he's my brother, so they see him all the time. But my parents know Chris Keish through me because I love Chris. They know Doug and Robin through me because I love Doug and Robin. They know you because I love you and Ian. So they know the body of Christ because we love each other. They know Hans and you guys. Like, you know, My parents didn't know that I was hanging out with Lori until I moved back here because she's part of the body of Christ and I love her. So the world will look in at the church and say, they love one another. That's how they characterize us, by our love one for another. So when the world looks in, they ought to be able to identify us by our love one for another. So I just use it as an example. When my parents look into my relationship with my friends, they have to those are his friends. He loves them. That's part of his church. And that's that's the common ground they have is Christ. Or my friends from work or other people, they look into like they look into my life. They know I talk about these people because I love them. I think the meals that are going out to so the new mothers, like a yeah. really, really know that the church supplies for a couple of weeks yeah. at least. It's a huge testimony. It's a testimony to the outside. My sister's sitting there the other night. I'm sitting with her at my parents' house, and uh, Amanda's talking about the meal list and everything. I think my sister was taken back by the fact that people were bringing us dinner every other night for three weeks. She's like, yeah, you get in the middle, end of February or something. You know, if you want to bring me on February, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, I just think it was surprising to her. So those those are signs of a healthy church. I love that. But the world will recognize that by our love one for another. And that's Patrick, who was my nephew, a couple weeks ago. They saw, you know, Adrian bringing everybody their dishes back. And I think they were like, huh, you know, like, what's going on? And then, <clears throat> Somebody brought me some maternity clothes, and mm-hmm. so they really they were watching for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, I think that's that's what they do. I can use my in-laws for this, but they always watch in the church. I know that's where you are now. If you say something bad, they they spoil the right away. Yeah, yeah. They and the same thing about in my life too. Mm-hmm. If it doesn't align somehow, they know. If it doesn't align. They don't serve the Lord, but they, they know if it doesn't align, they, they, they lose the call. Yeah. That's yeah. Then you, you call yourself a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I just take yeah. that. So it's, it's, it goes both ways. That's yeah. such yeah. a good sign. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's why it's important to deal with church issues. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm. Um, yeah, I think it's so important to deal with those quickly. I'm not going to go into details, but they need to be addressed quickly and concisely. And the longer we let them linger, which is kind of what Hans, I don't want to say you're not getting on to that area, but we need to note that, that if we don't deal with church issues quickly, the world notices that really quick. Because then they point the finger, you know. So. And corruption and corrosion starts within the church. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah. things are not healthy. I mean, I heard this statement this week. I thought it was interesting. He said, uh, 20 lukewarm Christians is worse than one atheist. <laughs> than one atheist? Yeah. Because it, we, they destroy themselves by the, they, the testimony. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I'm not sure exactly how I want to say that, but you know what I mean. It, it hurts the whole body when it's a false testimony or a bad testimony. Worse than an atheist, somebody who just says there is no God. And, and I think what they appreciate too is they, they tell me. Sometimes I'm witnessing, I use my sin. Yeah. The sin I committed to the 
or they don't think of what I'll think or what they do. So then they, then they see and you know the Superman, you know, the, 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 the thing I saw, I did myself, but then God said, hey, if you try this thing like that, God will his face and he doesn't do that. So, you know, but I think they, they, they see you not know, just uh, pretending, you know, they better than them. You know, you know. Yeah, so I think it's... 10.13. No, exactly. Um, one other point that was raised that I thought was interesting is we often focus on what we're supposed to do and not who we are supposed to be. We play it out like we're supposed to do this, supposed to do this, supposed to do this, as opposed to if we're filled by the Holy Spirit, don't we know what we're supposed to I mean, we ought to not act it out. That's why uh, I remember one time John said to me, he's like, what did you mean by acting like that in a sermon? And I said, what I mean by acting out is if we act like Christians, we we ought not to put on an act. It's not a show. It's not framed. It's not ornamental. It is genuine. We are genuinely filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not an act. It is. We we know. We know how we should love each other, and it's not just an act. That that's really that's not good to act it out. Um. So, um, the visible mark of the church is the love the church has for one another, and. Uh, 14, 10, 14. I got a couple minutes. I got six minutes. I'm going to try and do this. A couple different kinds of love. Sacrificial love. And it's funny. Some of these points are the same. We sacrificially love each other. Whether it be through gifts, through um, giving up things we would like for the other parts of the body of Christ, we sacrificially love our church. Everything that we have is the Lord. So think about that. We selflessly to love the body of Christ. Philippians 2, 3 through 4, 5, 6. Um, I just want to read them all. Yeah. I've seen this in, for example, uh, Mary, you know, Mary, yeah. uh, how she just, she cleaned out her house and somebody else could come in. You know, you've seen those examples. Right? Even the Bill Green and Bonnie, you know, they, they say, you, if you use my house, you go there. The house, mm-hmm. It's like they're not there. You know, so it's kind of neat to see it. Exactly. Um, we self so selflessly, so we don't say it's not mine. It's not my house. It's it's for the Lord's work. Um, and it's not my way. I'd rather have the preference of others. Whenever I can do that, I'd rather have the preference of others. Um. So you put other people above your own self. So it's a selfless love. So sacrificial, selfless, we love unconditionally. In a marriage, we reconcile with our spouses. Uh, Shouldn't it be the same in the church? Unforgiveness kills a church so that we love unconditionally. Like I mentioned it earlier, when there's issues that are not reconciled, unforgiveness, that really hurts fellowship in the church. You you can't really have deep fellowship if there's unforgiveness. Um, So we love unconditionally. Four, we love graciously. Giving love that is not earned. We give love when it's not earned. So that's another way the church loves each other. This guy had a wonderful sermon. (laughs) Um, And uh, so those were the four. Actually five. He said, we love indiscriminately. So we love aside from the fact that we're black or white, uh, rich or poor, young or old. Whether we're bikers or cowboys or whatever it is, we love indiscriminately. And I think that is interesting because there's a, there's a group out there that has these affinity churches. And I don't know that that's that healthy because you can't have a, you know, an assembly full of legs. You can't have an assembly full of arms and you can't have an assembly full of tongues and hands. You need all parts of the body of Christ. So whatever... They are, um, you know, make up the body of Christ. So we love indiscriminately. Um, we are we are sadly building a building on natural and not on supernatural gospel. So what he's saying is this: we're building uh, a message around our affinity, our motorcycle group, or whatever, as opposed to building it around the gospel of Christ. 
So I warn you from doing that, you know. And even if you say, I go to a church that just has a lot of kids, or I go to a church that just has, you know, people my age that are retired. Um, I warn you against that because here's the thing. We need all parts of the body. And you know what? This is interesting. My daughter does quilting with Laureate. That's valuable. You know, that relationship is valuable. You're teaching her something. I can't teach her. Billy isn't teaching her. So you're, what you do is valuable to her. We need all parts of the body of Christ working together. In my old age. It's just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we need you, you need us, whatever age you are. I don't ever call people old anymore. I, got, I heard it from Bill one day, so I try not to go there anymore. I mentioned it from the pulpit, and he called me out on it in a bunch of emails or something afterward. <laughs> Out of love. Yeah, out of love. <laughs> Unconditional love. You see, uh, here I go being divisive, calling people old. Right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. The Bible's more focused on a healthy body than over a large worldly body. So it's not about numbers either. Um, yeah, so those are just some really cool points that I learned that day from that, that sermon with that. Pastor Bill in Binghamton, New York. I was blessed by it. But just spending the day on describing the culture of the church, our commission, what we look like, how we behave, and um, how we treat each other. So some cool stuff. I'll hit those. Over, and I'll, I'll say those six, those five points again: sacrificial love, selfless love, unconditional love, gracious love, and um, indiscriminate love.